Up to now, the Philips curve was ad hoc without any micro foundations. In the following, uh, I present different possibilities for micro founding and nominal rigidities uh, that uh, can lead to a new Keynesian Philips curve. And afterwards, we will focus on one of these possibilities, the model of Calvo, Calvo pricing, which is a very simple way of introducing these nominal rigidities, but it works so well that it's adopted in many, many papers, actually. While the details of uh, the approaches uh, differ, the common underlying property is that firms cannot adjust their prices in every period. Now, there are some differences across the different um, uh, models, but this is kind of the common thread. One way to introduce these nominal rigidities into the price setting behavior is the so-called Fisher model. Here, the assumption is that in each period, only half of the firms are able to set their prices and they have to set the price for two time periods. And uh, every other period, the second half of firms can set their prices again for two time periods. The prices may differ between the two time periods, but it's important that the information that arrives in the first period has then no effect on the firm's pricing policy for the second period. So um, if there is an exogenous shock that hits the economy in the first period, that would lead to a different price uh, that the firm should have chosen instead of the one that it uh, chose for the second period, it cannot adjust it. So it cannot change the price once it has been set. This means that prices are predetermined and there is some sluggishness in price adjustments then. The disadvantage is that there are no persistent effects of certain demand movements and shocks after two time periods. So then there is a rigidity, but the rigidity would only last for two time periods. A modification of that is the Taylor model, where the assumptions are basically similar to the Fisher model, except for the fact that the same price has to be set for two time periods. In this case, the prices are not just predetermined, but fixed, so they cannot change. And um, the price adjustment is therefore sluggish for more than two periods. The disadvantage is that it is difficult to generalize the model to more than two time periods, and it quickly becomes um, intractable. And third, we have the Calvo model or Calvo pricing. In this case, firms face a certain probability with which they can adjust the price in a certain period. So they get a certain signal whether or not they can adjust their price. This also leads to a sluggish price adjustment mechanism. And the advantage of it is that it is very easy to implement and much easier than the two previous versions discussed. And this is the reason basically why it is used in most new Keynesian models. And in the following, we will also talk about uh, the Calvo model in more detail. Again, lowercase letters denote logarithms. Now the basic setting in the Calvo model is that a fraction of firms is allowed to change their price in period T. And this fraction is denoted by alpha and the choice variable is denoted by XT. So that's the price that they uh, charge in period T if they are then allowed to change their price in period T. And then a fraction 1 minus alpha firms is not allowed to change their price. They are stuck with some price that they have set at some point in the past. Then in this case, the aggregate price level in period T would therefore be a weighted average of the newly charged optimal price by the firms that can change the price and the share or the weight of this price is alpha, the share of firms that are allowed to change the price, and a share 1 minus alpha, that's the weight for uh, the price that did not change, pt minus 1. Now if we subtract pt minus 1 and uh, recall that uh, lowercase letters denote logarithms, we get the inflation rate on the left hand side, and on the right hand side we would get alpha times the difference of the new optimal price and the old price level from the previous period, PT minus 1. And here we see that inflation would be higher if the difference between the old price level and the newly chosen optimal price of the firms that are allowed to change the price is higher. That's intuitively clear. So if this price step is higher, then inflation would be higher in general because the price adjustment would be higher. And if the fraction of firms that are allowed to change their price is uh, larger, so that's also clear 
because then more firms would change the price and would make this adjustment and therefore also inflation would be higher. Next, the assumption uh, in the Calvo model is that the opportunity for a price change arrives stochastically according to a Poisson arrival process. And according to such a Poisson arrival process, the probability that a price that has been set in period T is still in effect in period T plus J is equal to the share of firms that are not allowed to change the price, which by the law of large numbers then for many firms would be the probability of no uh, price uh, change, raised to the power of J the number of periods that went by since time T. And then firms would set the price at time t so as to minimize a quadratic loss function of the form that we have here. So here the crucial term is that it's the deviation between the um, price that the firm sets in period t and uh, the future optimal price level at period t plus uh, j. So if the firm sets a different price than the optimal price, then of course this would lead to a loss as compared to the profit that the firm could make. So it's a reduction in profits basically. And uh, the square term here implies that uh, it's not linear in the deviation from the optimal price, this loss that the firms make, but quadratic. And then, of course, at uh, time t, when the firm sets the price xt, the firm does not have any information on periods above uh, time t, so we have to take the expectations operator here for the deviation of the actual price today and the optimal price in period t plus j. Then the firm discounts the future with a discount factor beta. That's raised to the power of j, and the sum goes over all these periods from time t to t plus j. Uh, and so this beta to the power of j uh, becomes smaller and smaller the further in the future we go. And this here is basically the probability that the, the price would still be the same uh, in this period uh, j. And if this probability is higher, then uh, uh, yeah, basically the firm would still be at the optimal price uh, choice. Okay, so if the actual price deviates from the optimal price, this leads uh, to a loss and this loss rises with the square of the gap between the actual and the optimal price. And that's what the firm wants to minimize. Therefore, we have the following minimization problem. Firms minimize L by choosing XT. That's the function that we had uh, on the previous slide. And now we can rewrite this because uh, the expectation of the square of a variable is basically the square of the expectation plus the variance. And since xt is known with the information at period t, we only have the expectation of um, pt plus j star, and therefore also only the variance of pt plus j star. So that's kind of how we can rewrite the minimization problem by making use of these um, stochastic properties, basically. Now we see if we want to minimize this uh, function here, we have to take the derivative with respect to xt. xt does not show up in the variance, so this term drops out. xt only shows up here, so we would have to um, take 2 from the exponent down and reduce the exponent by 1, so this would vanish here, and we would have this expression multiplied by the inner derivative, which is 1. So that's basically the expression that we have here. This is the 2 from the exponent. And then we have to set this equal to 0, which is the condition, the first order condition for a minimum. Now we can, uh, yeah, the, this term here, the 2 drops out, because if we divide by 2, um, that vanishes. And we can separate the two terms from here, so we would have the sum from j equal to 0 to infinity of beta to the power of j 1 minus alpha to the power of j xt, that's this term here. And on the other side, we would have the sum again uh, beta to the power of j 1 minus alpha to the power of j from here, multiplied by the expectation of the future optimal price. And now we see that on the left hand side, we actually have a geometric series that's uh, has a similar structure than the infinite sum from z to the power of j, which is 1 over 1 minus z. And uh, a similar structure we have here, except for the fact that the z um, term would be um, beta times 1 minus alpha. So 
this left hand side here is 1 over 1 minus beta times 1 minus alpha. And if we bring it to the right hand side, then we isolate xt on the left hand side. This term here is brought to the right hand side and multiplied with this sum that we have here. So then uh, what we would get is that the optimal price at time t that the firm should choose would be a weighted average of the expected future optimal prices with the weight again being determined by the discount factor and the probability that the price uh, set at time t would still be the same at time t plus j. Now what we can do here with this equation is we can decompose it into a part that we already know at time uh, t because we have all the relevant information and the expectations operator drops out and uh, the part where we do not have the relevant information everything from period t plus 1 onwards where we have to take the expectation that's done here so we have the first term here that is the optimal price actually today and the expectations operator then drops out so we would have that our optimal choice um, relates to the optimal price um, at time t today um, plus um, all the optimal ex the expected optimal prices from period t plus 1 onwards but here we see that uh, we can substitute in xt plus 1 uh, for this term because that would be the optimal choice from uh, t plus 1 onwards so we would have a kind of Bellman equation type of formulation where the optimal price today would be a weighted average between the optimal price um, that we know at time period t and the expected optimal future prices that would be um, in the optimal choice in period t plus 1. And then one can subtract pt from both uh, sides, then we would have xt minus pt on the left hand side and we can rewrite this uh, for later convenience as xt minus pt minus 1 minus pt minus pt minus 1 which is the same as xt minus pt on the left hand side and on the right hand side we would actually have uh, this term here and the deviation from uh, the actual price from the optimal price uh, pt star minus pt and here we would have the deviation of the expected optimal prices in the future from uh, pt and then we can use a number of things that we've derived before. Uh, namely that xt minus pt minus 1 is actually the inflation rate divided by alpha. The expected xt plus 1 minus pt is actually this equation just iterated one period forward where we do have the information only as of time t. So we would have expected inflation uh, pt divided by alpha. Then pt minus pt minus 1 is the inflation rate. And from the first order condition of optimal labor supply previously, we know that the difference between the optimal price and the actual price would be a function of the actual output level phi. And if we plug all that into this equation here, we would get this expression. And this expression can then be solved for the inflation rate, which is then the micro-founded new Keynesian Phillips curve. And this expression that we get by this reformulation is written down here. So we have uh, the inflation rate as a function of a lot of parameters and uh, output yt and another um, set of parameters and expected future inflation actually. And if we summarize this and put um, uh, this, uh, this term here, we write it down as a kappa, which is uh, this term that we have here. Then what we would get is actually kappa times yt plus beta times um, expected future inflation. And here uh, these two alpha, uh, one minus alpha terms drop out and this alpha drops out with this alpha. So we would get this expression here. Now this is the new Keynesian Phillips curve. And now it's indeed micro-founded. So it has been derived based on optimal firm behavior in a setting when firms cannot change the price in each period, but uh, the opportunity for a price change arrives stochastically. And the, this inflation rate here is actually derived by aggregating the behavior of the different 
price setters that face a certain barrier to the price adjustment. What's new now here is that the current expectation of next period's inflation actually uh, represents core inflation. So we have an expectations augmented Phillips curve, if you will. And now we can summarize the model, and that's basically the canonical new Keynesian model. We would have a new Keynesian IS curve, which is that output at time t depends on expected future output at time t plus 1. Uh, in a positive manner, it depends on the real interest rate in a negative manner, and we allow for an IS shock, so that's a demand shock. Then we would have a new Keynesian Phillips curve, where the inflation rate depends on expected future inflation, which is core inflation in this case, so that's the expectation of inflation of the agents in the economy. So if they expect higher inflation, this would lead to an upward pressure to, on actual inflation already. It depends on output, and we again allow also for a shock uh, to inflation, which is actually a supply shock in this case, so to the AS curve, if you will. And then we have a forward-looking interest rate rule, a Taylor rule, which would determine the behavior of the central bank. And in this case, as it is written down here, uh, the interest rate, the, the, the real interest rate set by the central bank would increase if expected inflation is higher, and phi would be the reaction of the central bank to a higher uh, inflation expectation. And it would also be higher if expected future output is higher. And phi y would be the reaction to changes in expected future outputs. And here we also allow for a monetary policy shock, basically. And now this model can be solved recursively uh, in MATLAB and, and other programs. So typically it's simulated, so you cannot really solve this um, analytically. So this is really the simplest canonical new Keynesian model that you can uh, think of. And of course, there have been many critiques applied to that. It's a highly stylized framework, of course. Uh, and that means it doesn't capture many of the aspects that modern economies um, yeah, are characterized by. For example, the treatment of financial markets is missing in this case. So financial markets actually play no role in, um, in this model so far. So the real interest rate is set by the central bank, and that's also the real interest rate that agents face. So there is no wedge between that. Investment is missing. There was no capital in the model. Um, fiscal policy plays no role, uh, there is only one economy, there are no open economy considerations, no trade, no international capital flows, and so on and so forth. And there are many more critiques, of course, that can be um, applied. However, there are also many extensions that exist and efforts that are even ongoing uh, to improve the framework, of course, particularly since the uh, Great Recession. Uh, it was um, on the top of the research agenda of many people in this research field to introduce financial markets and to show how frictions in financial markets uh, actually affect uh, output volatility and um, probabilities of recessions and so on and so forth. Habit formation of households, uh, which might lead to persistence of inflation and all these kind of things. And of course, this framework has then also been used to try to explain the phenomenon of secular stagnation. Um, overall, what we can say is that the model is very stylized, this basic model, but it also leads to interesting insights and dynamics. And in particular, we can uh, microfound the ISLM uh, ASAD framework that we know from introductory microeconomics. In this way, we can introduce dynamics into the model and show that uh, the kind of dynamics that we can describe by these, uh, this model and uh, the uh, intuitive uh, changes that we often um, analyze with respect to monetary policy changes and so on and so forth, they can be generalized to such a dynamic uh, framework that is microfounded.